Hey, church family. My name is Taylor Braswell. I'm one of the pastors here at First Baptist Church, Fort Mill. We're so excited you've joined us online today to worship and hear from God's word. Hey, we've loved hearing from you during this time and want to continue to know what's going on in your life and the life of your family. Let us know how we can be supporting you and praying for you by sending us an email at pray at fbcfm.com. Today, Pastor Derek Kaiser will be continuing in our sermon series from the Gospel of John called That You May Believe. We pray today's message helps you grow in your love for God. Good morning. My name is Derek. I'm one of the student pastors here at First Baptist, and I'm excited to be able to just preach God's Word with you guys today and to speak to you, whether you're in the chapel, whether you're at home. And so we just appreciate so much you tuning in and being a part of what's going on here. Um, Pastor Jeff will be back next week, but just got the privilege to preach your 
um, the sermon to you this morning. So the, the title of this passage and the, that we're going to talk about the sermon is The Greatest Gift of All. We're going to be talking about it from John 3, 16 through 21, but have some questions um, just to think about as we get ready to go into this passage. Um, and so first thing I want to ask just to, to kind of have some fun for maybe some conversation for you at home is what is the greatest present you've ever gotten? Or maybe the greatest gift you've ever given. And so as Christmas is approaching, I don't know about you, but I want some sense of normalcy and I'm looking forward to Christmas to where even if we have to stay at home and hang out with just our family, we will have decorated houses and we'll have fun things to do. And so I'm looking forward to Christmas and just as I was thinking through this, the things came to mind of Christmas presents and presents. And so um, after this sermon, you as a family, if you're at home, just discuss what are some of the greatest presents you've ever given or gotten and just think through that for those of y'all um, that are listening to this. And so here I ask the same question of the staff. I'm going to share a couple of mine and then some of the ones that the staff share with me as well. And sometimes it's a practical gift. Sometimes it's like the best fun gift ever, but sometimes it's just practical. And so um, for me, when I was a kid, I got a Nintendo, the original Nintendo with Duck Hunt. My dad and I would play Duck Hunt and it was fun. I think it's still around somewhere. Just thinking through this sermon, I want to go find it. Um, but Duck Hunt and then Mario Brothers, I believe was the other game I played all the time. Uh, there was all kinds of games that we played and that was a big deal. At first, my parents stuck me with a black and white hand-me-down TV with, with it, but eventually I got a, a color TV and then a bigger color TV as I got older to use that on. And so just Nintendo, that was a big deal. When I was a teenager, this is one I still have to this day. Um, my grandfather gave my dad and I a 1953 GMC truck that had been sitting in the garage for like 20 years and wasn't running. And it was his truck and it was kind of beat up. And so just as a teenager getting to work on that and restore it and just do things and learn things, mechanics about a vehicle that I could actually see stuff unlike the new vehicles today and actually work on it myself. Like I love that. And so my dad and I kind of restored that together when I was a teenager. It may have even been before I got my license, I'm not sure. And so that's something um, kind of more in recent days. Um, as an adult, some Christmas kind of sticks out as kind of a time frame for Kelly and I and presents and gifts and moments. And so for us, December 23rd, 2013, I got down on one knee at the Biltmore House overlooking the um, the big Billmore house up in a gazebo with a photographer in the bushes and asked her if she would marry me. And she said, yes. Uh, we joked today. I'm glad she said yes, or she would have had to bum a ride back. But she said yes. And that started our um, engagement that led to our marriage. And then kind of a more recent, um, December 24th, 2017, right? For those of you on campus, right out here um, in the lobby, sometimes we have like a backdrop for people to come take family pictures um, with. And so that day on December 24, 2017, Kelly and I took our first family picture of three. Nobody else knew it, but that morning, we had just taken a pregnancy test and found out she was pregnant with Jackson. And so those are kind of the things that stick out to me. I asked these questions to staff members too, and got some answers, some super practical, some exciting and fun. And so I'll just share some of those with you. Um, Taylor was big into skateboarding and when he was in high school and his parents bought him a, a skateboarding ramp. And so that was such a big deal to him because that was his thing. And so he was able to skateboard. I'm not sure if it was the driveway or the backyard, but he told me that was one of the big things for him. For Ken, he said matchbox box cars and specifically the track that went with them, but also a big wheel. And he said he was the king of the sidewalk and he was just riding around in the big wheel um, being a big guy, he thought. Angie really practical here, but she got some really nice knives and pans from her in-laws in the last couple of years. Really good knives, super sharp. She even told me, showed me one day this week when we were talking about it, that a one of the knives, she's barely touched it and it cut her, very sharp knife. And so that was a big deal for her. This one is kind of super practical, but also um, just a lot of thought went into it for Alice. Um, we all know how college students are poor and sometimes they just don't eat well. They eat a lot of junk food and um, whatever they can get, whatever's the cheapest. And so Alice, when she was right out of college, first year teacher, she um, was going home for Christmas and her grandmother gave her this really heavy box that clanked around and she opened it up and it was a box full of mason jars 
filled with things like green beans and pickles and jams and jellies. And it was a special gift from home, but also the specialness of it that her grandmother actually put in the effort and the love into getting those things together and canned for her. For Diane, apparently it was hubcaps. It sounds like a strange gift, but for her it was Roger, her husband, had nice wheels and everything on his car, and somebody had stolen just one of her hubcaps. And she was just getting tired of driving around with missing one hubcap, embarrassed by it. And so Roger gave, you, gave her hubcaps for Christmas, and he was just reluctant, but he did it, and she loved them. Um, for Karen, it was a doll named Velvet. And this doll, I've never heard of this, it was a purple velvet dress and blonde hair that you could make the, the hair longer or shorter by turning some knob in the back of the doll. And then when she was 15, her brother gave her a, a bracelet and it was a really cool gift, but not just that, but how she um, had to open it. It was actually in a can and you had to use a can opener to get that, that bracelet out. And she told me a story that's pretty funny for Megan and Brandon, her kids, they were so good at guessing presents and Roy, her husband and Karen decided to just mess with them one year. And so she mislabeled all of their presents intentionally. And so she put Megan's presents in Brandon's boxes and brought Brandon's presents in Megan's boxes and let them guess. And then at the end of all our guessing, made them switch to realize that they were guessing the wrong boxes for the wrong presents. For um, Shannon, it was a bicycle when he was a kid. I think he said it had a banana seat on it. As a young married couple, him and Amity, um, had some more money, he said, back then before kids and before all that. And so Amity bought him a nice set of golf clubs. And got, we know Shannon's a golfer and he loves that. So it was a nice set of golf clubs. And then his boys, um, David and Will, bought him a Yeti cooler with a bunch of Clemson stickers on it. You know, Clemson, you know, Shannon doesn't really like Clemson at all. I'm sure that had nothing to do with how much he loved it. But Shannon um, with the Yeti cooler, Johnny was telling me... Um, a really special present, I'm not sure if it was Christmas or birthday or around that time period, that Stephanie and David, Stephanie's his middle daughter, had given him and Trish a set of Clemson booties to open up. And the significance of that was, that was how they announced that Trish and Johnny were gonna be grandparents to their first grandchild. And so those were special for Brian. It was a Martin guitar, he still has it. It's still in his office, he showed it to me. Um, and a PlayStation as a kid. And Terry was telling me one of the favorite gifts that he had for his boys was a train um, table and just the joy. And I know as parents, sometimes we get excitement just from giving presents to kids. And so I have a two-year-old son um, trying to figure out stuff for Christmas. So if you guys have any great ideas for gifts for that age group, I would love <laughs> that idea as well. And so we talk about all these gifts. The title of the sermon is The Greatest Gift of All. But ultimately, I'm talking about the greatest gift of all for all of us in this place, um, the, in the chapel, listening to us online, is salvation. And so we're going to talk about that. But I'm going to cover the whole book of the Bible, the whole books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation this morning, um, and then come back to John 3.16. If you'll hang with me, I promise it won't take too long. Um, and so I want to start with a story from the Old Testament in Genesis and so this is Abraham and Isaac. And so when we think about the Old Testament, we realize in Genesis, God created man in the image of God. Everything was good. Everything was perfect. And then the fall happened. Sin entered the world and sin separated man from God. And from there on out, we've had a struggle between sin. And it separated us from a holy God and a perfect God. And so um, there had to be sacrifices in the sacrificial system an animal, a perfect animal, had to be sacrificed for sin because for sin, there has to be death. There has to be a sacrifice. And so this story we pick up with Abraham and his son Isaac um, on a mountain. And so if you would, if you're following along, Genesis 22, 1 through 14 is the passage. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took off his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. 
And Abraham took up the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the, the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord shall be provided. And so Abraham um, and Isaac, and we've got this story of, Abraham having to go up to this mountain and willingness to sacrifice his own son. And so several questions from this passage I have that I hope we're going to kind of come back to in a second. So Abraham and Isaac, who's going to provide a sacrifice? That's a legitimate question from Isaac. He's just like, uh, Dad, where, what, what's going on here? Like, where's the sacrifice? How did that lamb, that ram get into the bushes? How did that just happen? And where can we find a lamb as a sacrifice for our sins? Because as I mentioned in the Old Testament, there was a requirement of a sacrifice for sins. I'm going to go to another passage in Isaiah. When we talk about this passage, we call it the suffering servant or talk about this. And so this is a prophecy of a coming Messiah who would come and be that sacrifice. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And so as we read this, this passage in Isaiah, it's a prophecy of the coming Messiah that would come that would be in place of our sin, that he would suffer for us, that he would die for us like a lamb. And then if we go to Revelation 5, I told you I would go generous to Revelation. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which were the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which were the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And so as we come to John three sixteen, I want us to think about this, this lamb, this Jesus Christ is who that lamb is that came, who was the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, who died on the cross in place of our sins. For those of us that are believers, he died on the cross for our sins, to save us from our sins in our place. And so as we come to John 3, 16, a passage that is so common, we see it painted under people's eyes and sporting events and on signs that people hold up. And I feel like we've almost it's gotten so common because we're so used to it. I don't want us to skip over the fact that a sacrifice had to be made for sin. There was a requirement. And so if you would turn with me to John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So this passage, we know it, we've heard it, we've read it, we've seen it over and over and over. And what does it really say? To have eternal life, if we read it backwards, we have to believe in him who God sent his only son. 
I don't know about you, I'm a father. Um, some of you have sons. The idea of giving my son up for anyone is not something I can conceive of. Is it possible I may give my own life for someone? Yes, but my own son, just as a father coming to this passage, there's so much there. But to a Jew Jewish audience that's reading this passage, I don't want us to miss something else. Like whoever believes could be saved. The Jewish people were very special. They were God's people. And for them to hear that whoever believed. Gentiles, you mean a Gentile can be saved too? Whoever, for those of us that have become believers, we realize that Jesus Christ can save us from our sins. Regardless of how much sin we've had, regardless of how bad a person we are, whoever is what this passage says. So what does it mean to believe? Is that just an intellectual understanding? It's far beyond that. It's just not believing in a story, not believing in just that Jesus was a good person because a lot of people believe that. It's believing that Jesus was God's son. He came, he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for my sins. Not only that, he was resurrected and stand at the right hand of God the Father today. And so we have to believe, and if we believe this, this belief is not just an intellectual understanding, it changes everything. Matt Papa wrote a song and he says, if this is true, it changes everything. And this is true and it should change everything. For the people that really believe this, for those of us that are Christ followers, and we believe John 3:16, and we believe the gospel, it should change everything about our life. And so what is eternal life? Eternal is a really weird concept. Like, what is that like? It began and it never, it never began and it never ended. It lasts forever. We will live eternity somewhere. And what does that mean? For eternity is, and there's no end, we will live somewhere. Our soul will live somewhere in a place called heaven with God or a place absent of God in a place called hell. And so eternity, our souls will spend somewhere. And so for us to believe in Jesus and to believe in the gospel, to believe in what he's done means we get to spend eternity in a place called heaven. One of my favorite verses um, in the Bible is 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For our sake he made him to be sin. Christ was perfect in every way, but God made him to be my sin, so that in him I get his righteousness. Some call it the great exchange. Christ got our sin and paid for that penalty of that sin on the cross. We got his perfection. And so I get Christ's benefit of his righteousness and I get to go to heaven because of what he did on the cross. And so as we think about John 3.16, we can't just think about John 3.16. We have to think about John 3.15 and 3.17. So what Shannon covered last week in John 3.15 the end of that passage is Moses lifted up a serpent, a bronze serpent on a statue. Um, and it talked about numbers that how this group of people, if they were bit by a serpent and they looked to the serpent, they could live. In the same way, if we look to the cross and we look to the crucified Christ on the cross, we can look to him, believe in him and believe in this gospel and we can be saved. And so as we look to John 3, 17, we also see the context that God, according to verse 3, 17, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And so Christ, when he come the first time, when he came the first time, it's not about judging the world. It was about giving the world an opportunity to be saved. And so um, God's ultimate reason for sending Christ was not to judge people. His ultimate reason for sending Christ was that everyone in the world would have an opportunity, have access to heaven through Christ offer of salvation. I'm going to continue in verse 18 as we continue to think about this. John 3, 18 says this, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And so if we've, if I, if you have accepted Jesus as our Lord, our savior, we're not judged. In fact, Christ has already taken the judgment, the punishment for us. We get heaven. But if we're not a believer, if we're not a Christian, it says that we've already been judged. It says that like we've rejected Christ and that's how we're being judged, not that we individually judge one another. And this comes into play because y'all have non-believing friends, maybe even family members that say things like, don't judge me or you're judging me or church people are judgmental. So 
for those of us um, in this room that have those people in our life, which all of us, we're not judging them. They've judged themselves already. They've made a decision by not accepting Christ. They've ignored the gospel or just said it's not true. They've sending themselves to an eternal separation from God for all eternity in a place called hell. And none of us want that. It's not that we're trying to judge them and send them there. We can't even do that. They're rejecting the gospel, their offer of salvation. And as a result of that, they're sending themselves to hell. Here's a scenario that I thought through and I found a good quote on it um, that I'll get to in a second there. Um, but let's say you go to the doctor's office. The doctor tells you there's something wrong, something really bad wrong. You're gonna be really sick and or die of this condition. But then the doctor says, but I've got good news for you. We have known about this disease. We've known about this condition. Modern medical technology, I've got a pill for you. It's not even an expensive pill. It's a pill. If you take this pill, you'll be healed. No problem. Full recovery. No problems ever. Is that doctor being judgmental by telling you that you have a death sentence without this treatment? No, of course not. He's offering you a way out. He's offering you um, a solution to your problem. He's not being judgmental by telling you your problem, your condition, your medical condition. In the same way, when we share the gospel with someone, we're not being judgmental. We're sharing with them that just like us, we were sinful, separated from a holy God, but we have a solution. Jesus Christ came and fixed all that for us so that believing in him, we don't have to be separated from God for all eternity. We can have eternity in a place called heaven. And so Adrian Rogers, a well-known pastor, was known to tell this story. A man who got some terrible news from the doctor. He was certain to die unless he had a medication, which would cost more than a million dollars, which he did not have and could not hope to get. A single vial was all he needed, but it was so far out of reach. He fell to his knees and sobbed, begging the doctor for mercy, begging the doctor to find some way to get him the medicine. When he left, the doctor sought out to do just that, cashed out his retirement, working extra hours, selling piles of his hard-earned possessions for this patient. It was unattainable for the patient, but for the doctor possible, but painful. A few weeks later, the doctor called the patient to meet him in the office at a certain time. The patient arrived shortly before the doctor did. But when the physician came through the door, his hair was disheveled. His white shirt had splattered blood on it and a single red vial was in his hand. I have it, I raised the money and I found out there was only one vial left in the trial. I know that you would not make it to the next round. So I drove too fast across town, my car was hit my son died in the accident, but I told the police that I had to get back here or someone else would die. Exhausted, he handed the vial to the patient and collapsed in the chair. The patient took the vial, looked at it, poured it on the carpet, where it soaked into the fibers, lost forever. I don't want this one. Isn't there something else you can do for me, doctor? You have to help me. The truth is we all have a condition that will kill us. It's called sin. We're spiritually dead, separated from God. And if we don't take up Christ's offer of salvation, it's like telling the doctor, I realize that I'm gonna die if I don't take this pill, but I wanna die anyway. That doesn't make any logical sense. That's we, what we or our friends are doing when we reject the gospel. We're sending ourselves to eternity separated from God. That's what it means to be judged already. We have made that choice. As we continue in verse 19 and 20, I want us to think through kind of the illustration that's in this passage. It says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. So in verse 19 and 20, judgment's this, that the light, this is Jesus Christ, has come into the world. The people of the world, they liked the darkness better than they liked the light. They wanted their sin. All of us struggle with that. I don't know if y'all know this or not, but sin is fun sometimes. Sin is easier than not to sin. 
Our nature is to sin. Ever since Garden of Eden, ever since Adam and the fall, we all struggle with sin. We all have a sin nature. People that are not Christ followers, they live a life of sin as we did, and they hate the light. They don't want any part of it. They hate church and they hate being around people of God. Why? Because the things of God show their sin for what it is. Maybe you have a friend who just feels judged or being around you or don't want to be around you because you're a Christian and it just makes them awkward. Um, sometimes we have that as Christ followers. We have people that just feel that way. And so a passage of scripture that speaks to this is Hebrews 4.12. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from its sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And so just as Hebrews said, God's word, his light, and Jesus, his light, came to earth to show us truth. And through God's word, through the people of God who are being used by God and shining bright his truth, that just makes people feel awkward that are not believers. They, if you're trying to hide something, if you feel awkward about something or convicted about something, the light is not something you want to be around. And so um, on the other hand, we see in verse 19 and 20, and we're going to go with this in 21, that believers seek the light. They want to go towards the light. Let's think about it this way. Some people don't want to be around a psychologist or a counselor because they just think somehow the psychologist or counselor just knows what they're thinking. Like they have magical powers and can read their brain and know what's going on. That's not true, but sometimes I think people feel like that. In the same way, if you're a believer, some of your family, some of your friends may feel that way. They're doing, they're struggling with some sort of sin. They don't want to be around you. You don't have a clue what they're doing. It's not like you can read their mind or know what's going on, but because of your presence, because of God in your life, because of the Holy Spirit, they're convicted by just being around you. And so they don't want that. And so people that, that have this lifestyle of seeking God, those of us that are Christ followers, we come to the light. We want light. They want to be around, and we want to be around Christians and the church. And so as verse 21 it says, Whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. We as believers like to be around other believers, around other Christians, around the things of God. Because it's natural for us then. It, we are encouraged by it. We are uplifted. If we're trying to honor God, we want to be around that. We want some accountability in our life. We want some people to help us in our walk. We don't want to live in the darkness. We want to live in the light and around people that do the things of God. We all need other believers to help us with our blind spots. Just like you have a blind spot in your car, maybe it's over your right shoulder over there, a little bit here. Like we all need people to help us with that in our life. And so as believers, we want to come to the light. We want to come to the truth. My son, his name's Jackson. Um, he loves fans. He loves ceiling fans. From an early age, he could say that word, fan, and point toward it. And he wanted it to be on, fan on. We had a fan in his room, and I ended up having to take it down because it quit working, and we realized we never turned the fan on except to make him happy. Um, in the other rooms, we used ceiling fans, but not in his room. And so I knew it was going to be a problem. So I had him in his crib as I was taking it down, and I put up a light instead. And I convinced him that this was Jackson's light. And I told him that he was helping me put this light up. And I was telling him that he, he had his little plastic tools, that he was going to help Dad Dad put this light up. And I did that for a reason, because I wanted him to not be sad about the fan. But here's something that's interesting that's come out of that. He talks of himself in the third person, which is funny sometimes, but um, he calls himself Jackers. Um, but when Jackson wants to sleep, Jackson doesn't like the light. And he'll say things like this, no like it, no like it, Jackers light off. Because when he wants to sleep, he wants it to be dark. He doesn't want to see things around him, he wants to sleep. And I think in the same way, when we're spiritually asleep, separated from God. We don't want the things of God. We don't want the light. Before we were a believer, for those of us listening to this message that are believers, we were the same. If you're listening to this message now and you're not a believer, maybe you don't want the things of God because you know what 
it's going to end. You're going to have to change things. And so um, as we think about this, and I kind of close this up today, I want us to think about this as an illustration. I talked about Christmas. I want some sense of normalcy to come back. I'm thinking about Christmas and the excitement of giving gifts and my son ripping paper all over the place and throwing tissue paper everywhere. I'm thinking about presents. And adults, please don't mess up my illustration here, but typically, well, say if you're a kid, you don't buy your own Christmas presents. I know as adults, sometimes that happens, but you don't buy your own presents. Other people buy them for you. They pay for them. They go pick them out. They wrap them. And what is your responsibility on Christmas morning or whenever you exchange presents? Somebody picks up the box and it's got your name on it and they say, here you go. Whoever that gift giver, whoever that person is in your house that hands out all the presents and they offer it to you, what is your responsibility? Just to accept it. You didn't buy the gifts. You didn't pick it out. It was purchased for you and it was being given as a gift to you. Your only responsibility is to accept it and to hopefully be grateful for it. In the same way with salvation that we're talking about today, we can't earn salvation. We can't buy salvation. We can't buy our way to heaven. Our job is to accept the gift that Christ has already given us. And how do we do that? We're admitting to God that we're a sinner, separated from him by our sin. We're accepting his offer of salvation that he's already purchased on the cross on Calvary. And as we accept that gift, hopefully we're joyful and everything has changed and we're excited and that really is the best present we've ever received in our life. So as I close this up before I pray and before I get to making it personal, I wanna ask this question for those of y'all that are watching this online, those of you that are in chapel, those of y'all that are listening to this, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you placed your faith and the risen Savior. Because the message of the gospel, John 3, 16, if we miss this, that the way to heaven is by accepting the Son of God, the, who He sent, to be a sacrifice in our place, we've missed it. So have you accepted Christ today? And if not, why not? We would love to hear from you, and we would love for you to reach out to us as a staff and pray at fbcfm.com. Reach out to a pastor if you know one of us personally and have our emails and find our emails on the website or send us a text, give us a call. We would love to have that conversation with you. For now, I'd like to pray for us and then I want to point out some things of how we can make this personal. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for today and your gift of salvation and your son offering us a free gift on the cross. We thank you for what you've done in Christ that he stands ready to intercede for us right now. God, I pray for anyone in the sound of my voice that hasn't accepted Christ, that they would, that in this moment, your Holy Spirit would convict them of their sin, draw them to you and save them from their sin. We thank you for this amazing passage that is so common, but that we know there had to be a sacrifice for sin. That lamb that was slain is Jesus Christ, and he was offered on our behalf as a sacrifice for all time. And there's no longer a need for sacrifice because he did it once and for all with his own blood. And we thank you for the blood of Christ on the cross. May we pray, amen. So as we make this personal, what are some things that we need to do to apply this? The first thing is if you've not placed your faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross, that's your first thing today. We don't wanna pass by this passage or any of the book of John was written so that you may believe in the Son of God and then have, have eternal life. And so today, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Number two, what area of your life is still in darkness that you don't want God's light to shine on to change? Is there something that's dark that you feel convicted about and only you know about and it weirds you out to come to church or be around the people of God or to read God's word and you know it's something that you've got to change. Third, does your life show God's truth and light clearly enough for non-believers to see a difference and for those non-believers to want to ask questions? What's different about you? Why do you believe this? Why do you go to church on Sunday? Why are your kids in church? Why is this a priority to you? Who have you led into your inner circle, your friendship circle, to shine the light of God's truth in your life and to push you towards God? Are there people in your life that God are using to be the, His light 
his, use his word in your life to point you closer to him and to help you to see sin for what it is, holiness for what it is, and just to encourage you and be those brothers and sisters in Christ. And the last point, how is God's truth changing you today? Is God teaching you anything in this season of life? Just wanna thank you so much for joining in with us today online in the chapel, and we thank you so much for what um, you're just continuing to pray for our church, and we just thank you so much for tuning in today. It's in your name of Jesus that we can be thankful for. Have a great day. Hey, we hope today's message encouraged you and strengthened your relationship with Christ. If you feel like God's working in your life and you have any questions about our church or the sermon you just heard, we would love to come alongside you. You can send us an email at pray at fbcfm.com. Again, we wanna thank you so much for your faithfulness and giving during this time. Your generosity continues to make resources like this available. You can give online at fbcfm.com slash give. We would love to continue the conversation with you throughout this week on social media. Thank you so much for joining us today.